Galatians 1, 6 and 7. I'm astonished. I'm so astonished that you're quickly deserting the one who called you to live in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel, which is really no gospel at all. Evidently, some people are throwing you into confusion and are trying to pervert the gospel of Jesus Christ. When I look inside of the church today throughout our country, when I look outside of the church, I see a lot of confusion. I see a lot of chaos. I see a lot of fear. People wondering, what do I do next? What do we do next? Do we speak? Do we stay silent? How do we live our life? About 10 years ago, for some unknown reason or another, I decided to go back to school. Yeah, back to school. I had no idea what I was getting into. I didn't know what to bring to class. Do you bring a spiral notebook? Scantron, number two lead pencil? Big Chief, I didn't know. I called the college student. He said, all you need is a laptop. Got it, got it. So I went back to school in order to try to earn a doctorate degree. And when I went there, uh, my, my school was out, the seminary was out in California, and we had an incredible cohort of students from all over the world. There were other doctoral students from China, India, Nigeria, Kenya, people from all over the United States, black, white, Latino, male, female, Presbyterian, Pentecostal, Assembly of God, Baptist, Reformed. It was quite the motley crew, okay? But it was awesome. It was great. I I built built great friendships uh, with people and my classmates. I really enjoyed reading some of the uh, original uh, sources and uh, some philosophers I'd heard about and kind of read parts of. I really enjoyed that. Yet throughout some of the lectures given by the different professors, I heard a, a kind of teaching that I'd never really heard before that I started pushing back against. I didn't know what this was called. I, I didn't, you know, I didn't know where it came from. I didn't know why almost every professor at my conservative school had to add this in, but I would just kind of politely raise my hand and give some intellectual and theological pushback to this particular teaching. So about, I don't know, four years into it, we had to get ready to write our dissertation. And to do that, I had to write a 50-page paper on research. Did you get that? I had to write a 50-page research paper on research. Crazy, right? So in this, they gave us this incredible book. It's called Integral Research and Innovation. I called it the Purple Monster. When I was in seminary, we had a big green systematic theology book I called the Green Monster. This is the Purple Monster. Listen, if you've run out of Ambien and Lunesta, go on Amazon Drop some coin on this bad boy, and I guarantee you, you will sleep like a baby tonight. So I started diving into this book, and uh, (laughs) I just couldn't believe what I was reading in the book. Again, that particular teaching that it's kind of been strange to me was in almost every other page, every chapter. This book lifted up as positive examples Fidel Castro, the dictator from Cuba, and George Soros, the globalist who's trying to undermine our country as we speak. It's like, wow, this is crazy. What are they teaching? Well, what they were teaching in this book, what they were teaching in some of their lectures, not all of them, was something known as critical theory. Critical theory. And critical theory is a worldview or an ideology that came about really in the 1920s out of the Frankfurt School. So we'll go back to the chalkboard. I know you've been wondering, what's the blank? If you were here last week, it is critical theory. 
okay? So critical theory came out of the Frankfurt School in Germany in the 1920s. Uh, basically, critical theorists were former Marxists and they divided the world into two groups of people, those who are oppressed and those who are the oppressors, okay? And then after that, so you have the oppressed, the oppressors, and then you determine if you are oppressed by different ways. So you had critical gender theory, critical race theory, critical rationalism. So you divide people based upon their group identities, all right? So then you have this fun word I discovered, intersectionality, and then moral authority. So let me explain that a little bit. So, you divide up people based upon their gender, based upon their sexual orientation, based upon their race, based upon their economics, and you pit them against one another as those that are oppressed and those that, is the, those that are the oppressor, okay? So when you have different groups that overlap, okay, let's say if you are oppressed and you're more than one group, then you score more points in the game known as intersectionality. So for example, if you are a Latino male, you're not as oppressed as a Latino female. So if you're a Latino female, you're not as oppressed as a Latino lesbian female, okay? Get the game? So the more areas of, of oppression, either real or perceived that you have, the more you have intersectionality there, more connection, and then the more moral authority you have, as a person, okay? And the less responsible you are for your actions, whatever those actions are that you're taking. So this is what's being taught uh, in my school. This is what's being taught right now, some 10 years later, in almost every public school in America, every university, every college, private and public. It's in the government. It's probably in your company, it's in pro sports leagues, it's in college athletics. People and individuals, well-meaning, some intentional, some naively, have accepted this particular way of looking and viewing at the world and others. So, cancel culture, political correctness, identity politics, all flows from critical theory. Now, let me, let me say this, like I said, I have a lot of people, a lot of people I know, a lot of Christians who have fallen prey to the sway of, political, uh, of um, critical theory, and I understand it. Why? Because there are people in this world that are oppressed. There is inequality in this world. There is injustice in this world. There's racism in this world, no doubt about it. So I can understand you know, the appeal of anyone in our culture or in the church to be drawn into critical theory. However, here are some problems I have with it, okay? First of all, critical theory deceives. It's deceptive. Just like we looked at last week, postmodernism, which is a part of this formula, if you would, it's deceptive. It tricks people into thinking that they're being helpful, but when it's played out, it's actually harmful. And here's why it's harmful. It's because it divides people. It divides people based upon race, gender, sexuality. Where does that game stop when you start dividing people? Everybody could have an area in their life where you feel like you're oppressed or something about you that's made you oppressed. And you start dividing and dividing and dividing and you end up playing a very dangerous and deadly game. I'm not gonna play that game. It divides. And sometimes when you're a preacher, you're looking for three Ds, you gotta find some random word that it fit, but dumps, okay? It dumps responsibility 
on others or things external for them in their life. So it creates an entire culture of victimization. It allows you to abdicate your responsibility for your own life onto others. It, it's a lot of times I see it being fueled by a sense of rage and a sense of resentment. And it's simply not a good way, I think, to move forward in life as a human being, much less as someone who is a Christ follower inside the church. So that's a little bit, again, just a little bit, thumbnail sketch, if you would, about critical theory. And those are the problems um, I have with it. Now, you can look at different people who are critics of critical theory. And um, if you wanna look on the screen there, the slide, if you wanna take out a phone and take a picture of that, you might. You can look at the works of Vody Bauckham or Thomas Sowell, of Carol M. Swain, Glenn Lowry, or Chantelle Monique Dusan. Again, those folks have some excellent uh, content, excellent books, debates, dealing with critical theory. Now, some people might say, well, this is simply an evangelical Christian thing. No, it's not. If you want to look at other critics of critical theory, you can look at James Lindsay, who's an atheist. You can look at Douglas Murray, who's an atheist. You can look at Jordan Peterson, who's a Jungian clinical psychologist. So you can look at what they have said and how they have critiqued critical theory. Again, quick sum of critical theory of CT. The problem is oppression, the solution is activism, and the goal is equity. That's the dynamic there. But critical theory divides, critical theory destroys, and critical theory, I believe, is a clear and present danger for our country, but especially in the church. It's antithetical to the gospel of Jesus Christ, right? And what I would encourage you to do, if you've never heard of this, or maybe you're saying, man, I've kind of been persuaded by this. Listen, do your own research, okay? Do your own research. Find out, check it out, and see what you will find. Now, one of the things I almost forgot, that what happens is this. is So when you have Marxism, if you remember, Stalin, Mao in China, Castro in Cuba, Maduro now in Venezuela. All of this has led to a 110 million murders of their own people and the destruction of their countries. You have postmodernism which has led to relativism and morality and religion, so a sense of amorality, which I mean there's no, there's no standard for objective, right or wrong. Uh, what's right for you is not right for me. What's wrong for you is wrong. You combine these things in the formula, Marxism plus postmodernism plus critical theory, you have this neo-Marxism that, that kind of grows out of that. And there's this big, huge hammer coming down from the sky on you that destroys two things that we value greatly. And that we'll look at next week. So let's go back and think about where we started here. What do we need? We need the gospel according to Jesus Christ and not the gospel according to critical theory. Quick summation of the gospel. What's the problem? Sin. What's the solution? Christ. What's the goal? Love. That's the gospel. I am personally responsible for my sin. I am. I have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And let's see if I can center this. I think I did better last week.
There you go. I'm personally responsible for my sin. There are all kinds of sins. Lying, cheating, being a jerk, anger, lust, greed, racism, sexism, you know, they're all sins. Sin separates me from God. God made in God's image. You're made in God's image. We're all made in God's image. But, but we're broken. We, we have real shame and real guilt from the things that we've done that don't please God. What do I do about that? That's a heavy weight. God is a holy God. I'm an unholy person. I feel guilt and shame, alienation. What do I do about that? Like you're shopping, of course, right? That's what Adam and Eve did, remember? Before sin entered the picture, man, they had this idyllic relationship with God and nature and life and everything was great, but then they rebelled and they realized their shame, they realized their alienation, they realized their nakedness, and so they went shopping for some fig leaves to try to cover themselves up. And so that's what we do. And as I look at people who are living out this neo-Marxist dystopia and this critical theory way of looking at life, I see it as a way that they're simply trying to cover themselves. They're trying to build some righteousness that will cover their guilt and shame that we all have. You see, the only plus sign that we need is the cross, right? It's Christ. So when I trust in Christ and say, God, forgive me, then forgiveness flows from the cross. I can be forgiven I can be cleansed, I can be washed by God through Christ. And then through that forgiveness entering inside of me, I can learn to forgive others. There's forgiveness. And of course, there's love that flows to us through Christ. But something that's so powerful that took me such a long time to understand is this. And that is, as great as it is to be forgiven, as great as it is to have God's love in my heart, what I need deeply and profoundly from God is righteousness. If I'm forgiven and my slate is clean, I'm still kind of a, a zero, you know, kind of a, a nothing burger. Or as in math, you know, the null set. I need to have this positive righteousness so I can know that I know that God accepts me. Romans 1, 16 says this. He says, I'm not ashamed of the gospel because it is the power of God that brings salvation to everyone who believes, the Jew first, also to the Gentile. For in the gospel, the righteousness, check this out, from God is revealed a righteousness that is by faith from first to last, just as it is written, the righteous will live by faith. So I need this righteousness that's from God. My sin has alienated me and separated me from God. Christ can forgive me, and that's wonderful to be forgiven. 
But what's also amazing, as Paul talks about there, that in Romans 1 and Romans 3 and in Galatians 2 and Galatians 3 and in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and those different passages, he talks about when I trust in Christ, not only am I forgiven, but the very righteousness of Jesus Christ is credited to my account. Because in order to be accepted by God fully, we have to live a perfect life. Life, every single day, every second, every hour, every moment of your life, you have to perfectly obey God's word. If you do that, then you don't need Christ. No one can do that. No one can do that. No one. It's impossible. Everybody falls short. Mother Teresa falls short. Billy Graham falls short. I fall short. Everybody you know falls way short of that 100% perfect record, perfect righteousness. So God gives to us the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. Here we are, me and you. Boom. So the perfect, perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ is given to us and credited to our account. This righteousness, as Luther said, is external to us. It's outside of us. So if you ever feel like, golly, does God accept me? Does God love me? Have I done enough? Am I a good enough dad, a good enough mom? Am I a good enough friend, a good enough spouse? Or maybe I've sinned so much and so greatly, there's no way I can be forgiven. There's no way I can earn this. If you ever have those thoughts of insecurities and those feelings of dread, then I look outside of me to the righteousness of Jesus Christ. It's a righteousness from God. If a righteousness could be earned outside of the cross, then Christ died needlessly. He not only died in our place, he lived in our place. He lived a life of 33 years of perfect obedience. He's my righteousness. Not religion, not gender, not race, not education. He is my righteousness. He is my confidence. He is my boast. That's what it means to be in Christ. We we see Christ as our primary identity. We see Christ as our core. You are my brother, you are my sister in Christ. There's nothing else important besides that reality and that fact. But the grace of God, I love what Tim Keller said many years ago. He said this, listen to this quote. Think about this. He said, the real difference between a Christian and a non-Christian is not their attitude towards sin. The difference is their attitude towards their good deeds. The Pharisee, the self-righteous person, repents of their sin, but the Christian repents of his or her own righteousness as well, seeing it as only insufficient but sinful itself since it was done in order to save ourselves without Christ. So I'm gonna take all my sins and dump them in this pile right here. Just dump them all right here, okay? I'm gonna take all my good deeds my good works, the things that I think that I'm really righteous, way to go, a boy. I'm gonna take all those, all the scripture I've memorized, all the prayer times, all the DQTs, all the worshiping on Sunday, all the giving, the, all the stuff. I'm taking all of my things that I feel like are good and right. I'm gonna put them in the same pile and run away from my sins and run away from my so-called righteous works and I'm gonna run to Jesus Christ and his righteousness. And that's what's gonna give me peace and give you peace. Of 
obviously we want to do good. <laughs> obviously, I want to produce works of righteousness. Obviously, if I followed him. But these works of righteousness are never meritorious. They're never enough. That's why I'm dependent upon this righteousness that's from God, that's outside of me, that's in Jesus Christ. It's awesome. Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne, on Christ the solid rock I stand, all other ground is sinking sand. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. It's this grace, this righteousness. It's such an awesome part of the gospel and the good news of Christ. And when I see folks, especially young people, they're just sweating and striving and full of anger and hatred. I'm just saying, God, do you know about the righteousness of God in Christ? Do you know about his love for you? You know you can be set free from the anger and the resentment and the hurt through the gospel. Through the gospel. <laughs> Dietrich Bonhoeffer, who knew a little bit about what we're going through, said this. He said, the more genuine and deeper our community becomes, the more everything else between us will recede and the more clearly and purely will Jesus Christ and his work become the one and only thing that is alive between us. We have one another only through Christ, but through Christ we really do have one another. And we have one another completely. And for all eternity. And that's the way it is on this Sunday, October the 11th.